You're watching Chewing the Cud with Mike Bennion Rowe and Dominic Berry. Got us slapped by six out of seven dwarfs. Not happy. <laughs> oh, hello, and welcome to Chewing the Cud, your light hearted weekly look at a very rainbow kaleidoscope. This week, I'm joined by Dominic Berry. Hello, Dominic. Oh, hello. It's lovely to be here. It's good to have you back. Oh, it's always a joy to be here. Absolute joy. Uh, I'm here to bring you a story about a new BBC show, Mike. And then, are you ready to play a game? That sounded like out of a horror film. I was going to say, that's very it's a very <laughs> sore. A nice game, You spend Mike. your nice whole life game. slowly wanking. <laughs> well, crying wanking. <laughs> anyway, that's before we get Dom to regale us with some poems in Spotlight. But on screen now you can see our contact details. It's at the Cud TV on social media. And if you want to catch up with previous episodes, you can always binge us on YouTube. Just look for Chewing the Cud and on podcast services too. Definitely. And you can see the names of people who've reached out and touched our souls going along the bottom of the screen. And now it's time to get up to date on the things you might have missed from the news in The Buzz. Do you mind me asking your age? I'm very happy to say my age. Uh, I'm coming up for 45. 45? Well, congratulations, you don't look a day over 50. Um, <laughs> this is a story about a, a man who's been found in a cave. Um, he's 188 years old, apparently. OK. OK. And he's from India. Oh, OK. Um, and he's been found in a cave. And people are saying... On his own. On his own. Um, so he's saying he's 188. And people are going, are we sure? Because, I mean, he looks 188 with a nice little modesty flap on it. <laughs> People aren't sure. They're saying, yes, he definitely looks old. So he's on his own. He's the one saying he's 188. If yeah. you've been in the cave for more than a week, maybe you might lose count. But you'd still know how roughly how old he was. If he's saying how when he was born. Oh, OK. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, it's not the same. Detective. Exactly. Detective Mike. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So people go, well, he could be, but it's unlikely to be, because that would make him the world's oldest man by a good 50 years. Hmm. I think that, you said this is from India, right? Mm -hmm. Where they are famed for their, not in all parts of India, but meat-free diet. Love. I, I do speak quite a lot about me being vegan. I think you're a vegan. I, I think I did I, not know. I that. do. I do like. I think I'm probably going to make 189, 190 on my vegan diet. I you think, think so? so. Yeah, I think uh, I relate to this. Yeah. Okay. I'd, I don't think you will. <laughs> wow! Just, break it to I'm me just gently, gonna... Mike. <laughs> and what you want to? <laughs> well, he looks all right. Well, actually, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. I just 188 though. That's a long time to live. I'd like a beard like that. That would be that would be. I think cool. you can get one of those quite quickly. No, no. I, I'd like your beard, Mike. Mine's all like patchy and bald. Take it off if you want. It's only stuck on. <laughs> yeah. Not really ginger. It's a lie. <laughs> um, How lovely. Yeah, and a proof that you don't need running water, but sometimes you probably should have it. <laughs> um, moving on. Have you ever found something and gone, "Ooh, I like that." Oh, all the time. I've got that What's proper, like, magpie mentality. You're like, shiny thing, shiny thing. And then, like, obsessed with it. Like, so. what was the last thing you got obsessed with? Oh, the last thing I got obsessed Not with. Not person's bottom. It, it, <laughs> wow, it's like you've got, like, <laughs> no, exactly what was going to come out of his yeah. face. Yeah. If I'm ruling out men's bottoms, then... Probably like one of the, the I'm I'm a, I'm a big I'm a big gamer G A Y M E R and I'm not someone who'll just like casually play it. So like, let's go on Wikipedia, find out all the lore and oh, you know no. what year <laughs> was it released, all of that. So yeah, what 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 are you speaking of that's caught your eye? Mike? Well, it's not what's caught my eye. It's what's caught um, basically someone. You know, those people that go in house clearances and just it's like oh, it's an old lawnmower. I'll buy that and that sort of thing. We'll take that. We'll take mm. that, and then they sell it on. Um, well, someone found a. a a painting in a cellar, right, in a cheap, nasty frame. Mm -hmm. And it said to the woman, do you mind me having that? And she oh, no, take it. It's foul. It's awful. It's going, great, thanks very much. Turns out to be a Picasso, right? Um, so it, basically the experts go, no, it's generally an a, original Picasso that's been hung in this basement for years, decades, and the whole family hate it. That's why it's the <laughs> basement. 
right? Like, oh, it's ugly. It's awful. So I heard a similar story. I don't remember all the details, but someone who uh, had just been taping television on VHS for like mm -hmm. years and years. I had a collection, like proper collector made. A little bit like our backdrop. <laughs> <laughs> this is the gallery. Okay. <laughs> you ask what's in Dean's lockup, he tells you this sort of stuff and he's special forever, friend, and we don't want to know what that is. But in, in the name of like finding new interests, I was like looking up the history of horror movies in general. I was looking at what was the first horror movie and a copy of, I think, one of the first. We're talking silent movies. Mm -hmm. It's like seven minutes long. And it thought it had been lost to history. And someone had found it in a similar story to this. But the difference between this painting and that is that they'd watched all these VHSs. And it's like, how much stuff must get lost? Like treasures. Like this is a really significant part of cinematic history. And it's been found, and I watched it on YouTube, and it's dead good. It's very camp. I don't think it's meant to be camp. It's like, you know, man is a vampire going, woo! It's There's great. That, I what love it. What scary was back then? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> camp. Yeah. yeah. Um, How much stuff must just like go yeah. missing forever? Well, this painting is worth millions. <whistles> and this person just gave it to the junk seller. Whoa. Yeah, take it. I hate it. So, yeah. Also, be careful of what, what you give away. Mm. It's also a big thing there. Yeah. And if you have a, f a famous painting you want to give to me, it's <laughs> at the Good TV on social media. And that brings us nicely to our story of the week. Now, what's your personal stance on hallucinogenic substances? <laughs> um, well, you know, Mike, I am a person who is teetotal uh -huh. and have been for over a decade. So not just vegan, but like no alcohol. No, I do have coffee. So I do have caffeine. That's, yeah, that's yeah. you know, <laughs> that's caffeine my one vice. and men's bottoms are my two vices. That's it. That's just it. men's bottoms. Yeah, leave the rest of them. Just, just <laughs> <laughs> You have an old flesh like you like to do. <laughs> That'll get cut. Um, what hallucinogenic uh, marvels have entered the news this well, week? Well, this is a story about an Austrian man, mm -hmm. right, who decided to do some shrooms. Hallucinogens are being trialled a lot to combat things like ADHD and PTSD, right, just to tr in small quantities, right. Um, but this man went... I've heard about that research. Let me go and do a shed ton of them. Um, and so while off his face on mushrooms, decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take an axe and chop off my penis. Um, and so did. I thought that was a photo of his penis then. <laughs> oh, there it is. There's, there's, his, there's uh, his balls lit there. Lit like, literally got a mushroom head uh, there. Um, no, no, they're, they're shrooms. I've not got a picture of his penis <laughs> because he didn't just chop it off. He then he used an axe to chop it off and then continued to chop it to pieces and popped it in a jar with some dirty snow and soil because that's what he thought he should do. Well, that's not a good advert for shrooms, is it? No, that's not good. Do not good. do drugs, people. That's a, this um, isn't him. This isn't, this isn't him. him. This is a reenactment, <laughs> OK? Because rarely, normally I have their name and that sort of thing. We don't have his name. Nowhere has reported his name. He's still got a bottom, though, presumably. Has, it's uh, harder to chop off one's bottom, isn't oh, it? He might have had a go, we don't know. <laughs> um, but he was only found that that happened because he was wandering with said pieces of penis in the jar, right, um, bleeding out. There's a real horror theme to today's show. Like, when I said, do you want to play a game? And it sounded like sore, and, like, we're just... Oh, I'm too I, delicate I, I'm recently I'm single, so delicate. chopping off another man's penis... <laughs> I'll learn him. Um, I'm a child who, when I was young, I was scared of... Um, of... <laughs> quickly finish that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. When I was young, I liked to chop off people's penises. No, no, no. <laughs> the, I, I was terrified of, like... I remember being so scared of um, the, the, the Hollywood movie Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Like the most like delicate, you know the Kevin yeah, yeah. Costner. I know, I know which one you're talking just about. Just because like... there's like arrows in it, and I was, like, and you do see Kevin Costner's bottom in that. You do see that, and I was like, how could something with such a beautiful bottom feature such violence? I was really angry. I was an idiotic <laughs> child. I can remember being in the supermarket, and a poster was up. For... It made you angry. Maybe angry, but not as angry. <laughs> in the supermarket, there was a poster up for. Um, Hellraiser mm -hmm. with Pinhead mm -hmm. on. I can remember I cringed, saying this is true, this is a true story. I can remember saying really loudly to my mother, I, as a child, should not have to look at an image like that, Mum. 
in the middle of the supermarket. What a what a thing for a child to choose I mean, to do. I mean, I used to do evil things to my parents. I didn't do that. <laughs> so the, the famous story of my family is I was playing up in the supermarket on the Saturday shop, and my mum basically did what all parents do, go, will you behave? I fell to the, the floor crying, going, I'm sorry, please don't hit me again, mum. <laughs> That's calculated. Yeah, she's like, it's like, well, what do I do at that point? I can't like shout at you because it looks like I'm going to hit you. I want to hit you. <laughs> yeah, but that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. And what a what a deep insight into our two very different childhoods. Me as a as a political activist for the completely unimportant, <laughs> and you as a as a as a quite manipulative psychopath, uh, sadist. yeah, yeah, psychopath. yeah, yeah, yeah. sadistic psychopath. And it's a, it's a skill that I've brought into my very adulthood. <laughs> um, you're welcome, Dominic. Stay right there because coming up after this short break, we get up to date with the celebrity news with Dominic in the showbiz. Oh, welcome back, and you're watching Chewing the Cud. This is the part of the show where we take a look into the sparkly side of the world of celebrity. Celebrity by Sean Connery. In Showbiz with Dominic. Well, Mike, as someone in the performing arts world myself, I'm always interested in people with a Shakespearean background. Okay. And of course, you know, we've lost Maggie Smith, uh, 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 an actress who has a huge legacy of art and uh, talent from a specific traditional background. Mm -hmm. And Maggie Smith uh, was honoured, was honoured by someone with artistry from a very different background, the drag queen Benda La Creme. Ah, yes, when she did, when she did Snatch Game. Yeah, yeah, which is which, Mike? Which is which? I, I don't know. They're great. It's, it's great, isn't it? It's a great likeness of... Uh, it is. And, and, you know, Maggie Smith... Uh, before she passed, went on record, uh, you know, celebrating, saying that she liked uh, this uh, amazing representation of her through the world of drag, which is good because mm -hmm. the traditional background of arts, it's not a given that they all like the LGBTQ community. I, I know, but Maggie Smith definitely did. She's really good friends with Ian McKellen. Oh, I didn't know that. Did you not know that? No, no, no her and Ian McKellen, there's a lot of stories. So Ian McKellen did a skit on Saturday Night Live mm. a while ago of being Maggie Smith, <laughs> right? Um, and just flirting and stuff like that. So I took, took that old queen, Ian McKellen, out and they're really close friends. And, you know, I mean, what's, what's your favourite Maggie Smith film? Oh, she was in Sister Act, wasn't she? Was it she the was. first one? She was in all of them. All she, of was, them yeah. she was the... Um, Mother Superior. Of course, of yeah. course. Boogie Woogie on the piano. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really bad Maggie Smith. Impression. What's your favourite Maggie Smith moment? I'll expand the question, not just film. All right, okay. Cause... So, because film, it would be Lady in the Van. Oh, okay. That was a beautifully done piece of piece of film. Um, it's Anna Bennett, which, which I love as a writer anyway, but her acting in that was... Oh, sublime. That's being all cultured. I know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, good. I also like willies. <laughs> <laughs> Let's bring it back. Dominic likes bottoms. There we go. This is all, all back on screen now. Chris Hemsworth covered in Nutella. Leave that there for a moment. Um, I wouldn't leave it there. Um, my favourite, Maggie Smith, it's actually a, there's a, a TV like mini documentary a while ago with her and Judy Dench. And they were talking about, you know, getting older and still acting and still working and things. And she goes, oh, no, it's great. We we'll just get all this stuff that Judy doesn't do. Um, <laughs> and it's just seeing her just be completely natural and talk about her life and her career. Right. And then just joking about the fact that going, you know what? I'm not as well known as her, but I still get her cast off. So it's OK. Um, and, and just the great friendship she had with people. That is lovely. Mm. My least favourite Chris Hemsworth moment is finding out that in the movie Thor, mm -hmm. Love and Thunder, where I had so much enjoyed seeing his bare bottom. Wasn't it? Or so I thought. It was CGI. It was CGI, a lie. A lie. A lie about a man's bottom, the worst kind of lie. I know, I remember sharing that story with you on the show <laughs> and getting a very similar reaction. I've, 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 I'll, I don't think I'll ever get over it. I don't think... I've got the outtakes of, of the 25-minute tirade. I don't think you're going to get over it either. <laughs>
Moving on, though, Mike, moving on to other showbiz news this week. Uh, Mr. Loverman is a new drama which okay. is coming to the BBC. Now, it's based on a uh, 2013 novel, and uh, there's a character, uh, Norris de la Rue. Okay. And this character is uh, a character approaching his 75th birthday, uh, a guy from the Windrush generation, and uh, he comes out at All the right. age of 75. So to have this represented, oh, here we go, to have this represented in drama is a really fantastic thing. I think that any uh, black and minority ethnic representation of LGBTQ stuff is to be encouraged and, uh, and celebrated because uh, although this is a work of fiction, it's um, certainly, uh, yeah, something that needs to be talked about. Yeah, I mean, we very, very rarely get so I all the LGBTQ plus stories anyway. Um, so for it to become of a, a BME perspective as well, that's even... Wasn't he in Dark Materials? I don't know what a Dark Materials is. What's a, is that off the dark it's, web? No, it's, <laughs> it's off the telly box. Oh, off the telly box. I think okay. he was in Dark Materials. I remember yeah. um, in early in my poetic career, I was working for quite a big... LGBTQ organisation, who I shall not name. I shall not name and shame them. <laughs> no other one. That <laughs> no, I'm not going to say because I'm going to slag them off, and it weren't. It weren't either of them. It weren't either of them. I'm not going to say it weren't. <laughs> but if you keep guessing, right? I'm not saying. Okay. I'm not saying. Not okay. saying. They, uh, <laughs> oh, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> um, I was asked. Writing. <laughs> Brilliant, it I worked them. Um, they, they, they got me to, to put more sex in this creative writing. I was specifically asked, and you know, we all go through different phases of our life, and you know, different people have different words they use to identify themselves. And I was kind of thinking, am I a person who's asexual? I was thinking that at the time. Am I like, you know, not someone who even wants any of that? Uh, I just hadn't seen enough men's bottoms. That was my oh, okay. story. But um, I was really cross that I was encouraged to make it all be about, because that wasn't the story I wanted to tell. There were other parts of our identity. Mm -hmm. So to have this story represented, I feel very strongly about that because, you know, it's great to have stories about people of all ages. And we do have a lot of stories about younger people on their mm -hmm. younger journeys. And I think this is... Um, you know, really important because of the, the ethnicity, really important because of the age. I'm thrilled that this is yeah, being made. So I'm so excited that the BBC is actually doing something decent for once. Yeah. So yeah, that's really good. I've got one more story for you, Mike. One okay, more no. story. Um, now, I am not someone who watches much reality TV show, but I'm aware of The Bachelor. When you say not much, what that means you do watch some Sony. So what it is you watch... Just that was me being polite. I don't watch any. Oh, okay. I don't watch any. I, I, don't watch any. <laughs> I was ready with a big bag of judgment. <laughs> because normally when someone says, oh, I don't want to watch they a mean, lot, just like I do watch Love Island. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. No. Get the, yeah, yeah. no. The Bachelor, I believe, is one for the straights, I think. I think uh -huh. it is. Yeah, Are yeah. you familiar with it? It is. It's, it's, it's the worst type of reality. Oh, is it? It is. Because well, the only reason. Well, no, tell me why it's so the worst. They, they Slag get, it off. They Mike. get an attractive man right. and some attractive women, uh -huh. right? And then. I the, hate them already. The attractive <laughs> women have to make the attractive man want them. Ooh. So they do flirty, flirty, and then they have a rose ceremony and go, I'm giving you a rose, but you're not getting a rose, so you're going home. It's in front of everybody, and it's cutthroat, and it's supposed to be to find love. It's like, you can't find love like that. They're not shagging. How do you know if you, how do you, know if you love them until they're inside you? Just saying. Um, <laughs> it's just the worst idea. Well, um, there was one gentleman on one. The only reason I'm aware of this is uh -huh. because there's a gentleman who was on The Bachelor. He was the guy with all okay. the... But he's come out. He's come out as Oh, Thunderwood then. Absolutely. So that's it. I've not seen him on the show, but I have seen him here. So two uh, years later. So this is uh, with his partner, uh, Jordan, I think mm -hmm. is the name of his partner. Yeah. So they are together and they're, they're going to... Uh, have a baby together. They're going to have a family. They're oh. going to, you know, that that's their their plan, and you know, they look very happy in the photo. And uh, hooray! They are having a child, or they've had a child. Um, they have a child. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. Yeah, 
that's exciting. So new parents. Yeah. It's obviously before that because that they've not had they'll have no sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm smiling. Oh, a happy, happy, happy. Not for long. As a person who is a single person, I try not to become that cliche, grumpy, older gay who's oh, I like, I, I don't want this in a partner, I don't want that in a partner, I don't want the other. And, you know, things that I was more open-minded to when I was younger, I'm less open-minded to. And one of the things is when gay men wonderfully, joyfully, gloriously say, I'd like to have children. And I think, ooh, I'm glad that you do. <laughs> It's not not my part. I always had to think part. that I would want children, hmm. but I didn't want to be an old dad. Oh. So the shippers for me and children yeah. has now sailed yeah. um, because I grew up with an old dad, and okay. it was that I, you know, grumpy old guy that oh I can't be bothered. Or I'm too, it's like no, I don't want to be that person because I am that person now. Um, so I'm not going to have a child and bring them up to me going oh I just can't. Get well, them. I've come to the but. same conclusion through a completely opposite path. So my mum was a single mum who was a teenage mum who, mm -hmm. like in the 1980s, was massively shamed and judged. And I grew up as a kid with a little bit of awareness of that, but also joyful that my mum did have the energy, the enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And I looked at other kids who I school with their parents who were like not wanting to do stuff. And my mum was so up for us going places, going out. We, you know, I remember going to like rock concerts, seeing placebo with her, like, you know, putting our eyeliner on together, like mother oh, and gay son, oh, yeah. Taking a child to placebo, I'd have an objection to. <laughs> I think I was about like 14, 15 by this point. Okay, that's not too bad. Yeah, that's yeah. Just, imagine listen, six year old rocking on to Nancy <laughs> Boy. Like, Something about promiscuous before sex. That, before also. that, it was all the Lloyd's Webber, all the, all, the, all the cats, all the kind of dressing up with whiskers and all that malarkey. Explained so that much. Was it. Thank you for listening to my Showbiz Natter, Mike. That's wrapping up the Showbiz. Uh, that's all from Showbiz for this week. Well, thanks for that, Dominic. Always nice to know that celebrities are, you know, getting on doing family things. Um, <laughs> coming up soon, we have our game to play on Game of the Week. Welcome back to Chewing the Cud with me, Mike Benyon Rowe, and them, Dominic Berry. Hey. Now it's part of the show where we play a little game, but before we do, <laughs> Dominic, a little birdie, yeah. aka you, me. has told me about a, a certain something you may or may not have written recently that hey. may be new. Yes, yeah, yeah. You've got to forgive me. I'm still laughing at your um, Seven Dwarves joke from the start of the show. I'm still <laughs> chuckling at that. Yeah, right. This... Which one? The version that went out on TV <laughs> or the one that I told you that wasn't on the TV? <laughs> both versions. Uh, yeah, both. Yeah. The one that's both not broadcastable. Good. Both yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. yeah, that's not broadcast. No, no. no. This is not my book. <laughs> and this book, it's not any book. It's okay. the best book of my career, Mike. So far. Well, it might take some, might take some beating because it's the greatest hits. Okay. It's the very best of Dominic Berry. So um, the oldest poem. So I'm uh, as established earlier. I'm 45 this year. Mm -hmm. The earliest poem in is from when I was 18, and it's like uh, a career retrospective, Mike. So that would have been how many years ago? <laughs> oh, my maths. I could do words, not numbers. <laughs> Gallery could help out it's, rather than just sat there going. <laughs> but it's about twenty years worth of work. Is it over? Over two decades. Over, over, over twenty years. So that's what late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah, that's right. The oldest poem is uh, nineteen ninety eight. So uh, yeah, cool. yeah, there's a little year after each poem as well. Yeah. So there's like five new poems in here. You know, might even later on. Give a sneak peek of some of the new stuff, Mike. That might happen. That might happen. Who knows? Because that's what we're doing in part four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but nothing else planned. <laughs> Back on set, just in case anybody wants to know. Um, when is that book available? Uh, oh, good question. I'm doing a big launch for it at the start of December. Uh, okay. If you happen to be in Manchester, Manchester Central Library on Thursday the 12th? The twelfth. If okay. that's the if that's the number of the week that is a Thursday. Uh, Do words, Thursday? not numbers. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's Central what Central Library, that is. Yeah, six yeah. o'clock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I'm touring all over with it. So, uh, yeah, have a look. If if I'm a good boy, I'll update my website. I'm very poor at doing that. I should because I've got a big tour coming. Okay, yeah. so um, so your website will be on screen now. Oh, lovely. And can we see it on on social media as well? Do you keep people to say it there? 
Yeah, I'm on the Instagram at the poet Dominic. Yeah. Cool. And I'm sure people will follow along and, keep, and catch you where they can when you're touring. But for now, go away. Oh, exciting. Go, shoot. Okay, okay. That way, that way. Game of the Week. So we were going to play Ooza Kazoo, but Dominic, like so many other people, can't play a kazoo. Um, so instead we're playing the Gobby Game Show. Are you comfortable over there, Dominic? <laughs> Flies lit up when he saw the ball gag. <laughs> um, so what Dominic's going to do is Dominic's going to sing a song and I have to try and work out what it is. So I am ready for your first endeavour. <clears throat> Back my bitch up by the prodigy. No, closer, closer. Closer yeah. to smacking my bitch up. Yeah, yeah. Shall I tell you? Yeah, yeah, just tell me. Fat know. boy slim, right about now. Funk so brother, oh. check it out now. Funk so brother. I mean, it wasn't in the right tune, but yeah, great. <laughs> have we got... <laughs> Another one, maybe? Another one, right, right, okay, okay. Right, can I get him the number for some support services, please? <laughs> I think yeah. what you were having there was a season. <laughs> Do you want a clue? Yeah, let's have a clue. Right, so I've chosen three songs for you, and they're okay. all from a similar era of... Uh, so they're all from a similar year, and they're all of a similar genre of music. Three different groups. So we've had Fat Boy Slim. So it's okay. someone a bit a bit similar. Beck Devil's Haircut. No. <laughs> oh, um, Moby. I'll, I'll give you one final clue and okay. then I'll sing it again. Okay. So the vocalist. You don't need to sing it again. <laughs> the vocalist is from a very famous Manchester band who've just reformed. But this isn't one of their songs. This is him guesting with a different group. So this was somebody singing a song that's not where he normally sings a song. Correct. Correct. But that doesn't help because that just tells me that it's someone singing a song. <laughs> Shall I tell you? I, just, just tell me, just tell me. Um, it is Noel Gallagher with the Chemical Brothers and Let Forever Be. <laughs> Top ten hit, Mike, you know it. I, I'm aware of the song now. You oh. said the actual name of the song. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm pointing at. Do you know who's on? <laughs> do you know who's on my t-shirt? It's the prodigy. Okay. Well, the prodigy's dead, isn't he? Um, he can't sue us for this. <laughs> well, he didn't do the vocals. He only he only he only danced in this one. This is one of their earlier ones. Okay, one so we can 1991, still Mike. 1991. I don't know. I was like everybody viewing will know, Mike. You're the only person who doesn't. They won't. Out of space. I'm descending from outer space. Find another place. I take your mind to another dimension. I take your brain to another dimension. Pay close attention. 
Should I have done Madonna? <laughs> I don't know what song it is. That's the scary thing. Yeah, you You've do. You just sang it, and I don't know what song it is. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Do I? Yeah. Try to tell me that because I don't know uh, what it is. Space by Prodigy. Only like the dance what? song of the night is. That's Are you saying so... that was Outer Space by the Prodigy? Yeah, yeah, I am saying that. Yeah. What you just sang? I did sing it. Yeah, yeah. You have to give me another song now. Oh, okay, okay, right. I'll do I'll do a Madonna song for you. Right, okay, let's see. So we'll be able to get some Madonna it. one. <clears throat> because I'm crazy for you, I never wanted anyone like this. If you bang you, you'll feel it in my face. I'm crazy for you, crazy for What noise bum, are you doing? Bum, bum, ha, ha. I'm crazy for you, I'm crazy for you, cause you know where it's true. I'm crazy, crazy for you. <laughs> so normally in this game, we limit ourselves to no more than 20 seconds of the song. <laughs> And the reason for that is because of royalties and if you play... But the good news is, no f a clue what it is. So they'd have to find out what song it is and then go, oh no, that was something similar to what... Because they're not going to be able to. I know Madonna's back catalogue. I know the weird stuff. Yeah. And, and it's this mainstream no one. no idea what this is. It was, it was her first ever ballad. The first ever ballad was crazy for you. That's what I was doing. <laughs> I don't know what you were doing, but it was not crazy for you. Yeah, it was. Because I'm crazy That's for one, yeah. you. Yeah. That one. Yeah. No bum, idea what you were doing. Bum, bum, ah. Yeah. I'm so glad that poetry isn't <laughs> sung. Well, stick around, because coming up next, we have some poetry that's not being sung, I promise you, in um, Spotlight. <laughs> Welcome back, and you're still watching Mike and Dominic in Chewing the Cud. Now we're going to get a little bit of culture, and I'm not talking about what my GP asks for, in Spotlight. So I believe you have some poems for us, Dominic. Oh, Mike, I always have poems, and uh, I thought it'd be great to try out one of the new ones, if you're up for that. I'm always up for people experimenting on me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is a poem that I've written quite recently. The name of this poem is Ali's Loss. I think it goes like this. Here's Ali keeping busy working from his office chair. A colleague makes a quiet cutting quip about his hair. Last night he worked so late he didn't. Sleep keeps being tired. The boss says Ali's slow. He's scared of being fired. He's cut his debt but feels his work is work for work's sake. He's quiet when he's told work through tomorrow's lunch break. To keep this job he just says yes. He can't take time to rest. He keeps on being pleasant and he keeps on being stressed. Keep up by cutting sleep. The silent mouth stays shut. What should Ali keep? What can Ali cut? He keeps on cutting caffeine. He writes emails in bed. His nerves and iPod shuffle. Spice Girls play inside his head. With ginger tea, today's a mental health awareness course. He keeps attending. He's aware of mental health, of course. There'd be consequences if his feelings made him shout. Their mental health awareness seems to always be about Cutting wrong emotions is the goal to just keep glad. Is Ali at fault if Ali feels bad? Keep up by cutting sleep. The silent mouth stays shut. What should Ali keep? What can Ali cut? Lovely. Um, so what's that, what's that poem about? Um, <laughs> having a rubbish job that you hate. <laughs> yeah, I get that feel. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't putting my ideas on it, that's oh, all. I used to really <laughs> dislike it when I was in school and they'd do a big long poem about a chair. Look at the chair, look at its legs, look at the back of the chair. And they go, oh, what's this poem about? And I'd go, a chair. And the teacher would go, no, it's about um, religious anarchy. I'm like, what? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Uh, Don't you get that? Most of my poems are quite, you know, does what it says on the tin. I know, but um, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't sort of like projecting my thoughts about it onto <laughs> the poem. Oh, well, Ali really has a shitty job. Yeah, um, I feel really appreciative. You know, it's been a long old time now that I've done poetry as a job and I didn't just walk from school into poetry. It was like years of doing office jobs, cleaning jobs, bar jobs, nightclubs, and always writing the poetry. And um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that's part of a series of poems about Ali. That's not an isolated thing. The book's got um, got four different uh, little examinations of the, the life of Ali. But I thought that, that deserved a little snapshot moment. I think it's one that a lot of people can relate to. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, very, very can, yes. Um, do you have another one that I may be able to relate to? This is a poem called Ali's Tallies, and I think it goes like this. Wannabe. Number one, June 96. Say you'll be there was September. Mel C did high kicks. To become one, Christmas single. Top spot was not missed. Mama next. Statistics soothe. So focus on this list. Ali is diagnosed autistic at 40. His own dimlit backstory retconned. All of his memories are rewritten completely to give clearer continuity for this middle-aged man. His plan now is to simply be the best Ali he can be. Three years ago, he was sacked for screaming. Instant dismissal left Ali's eyes streaming. His life had been lived in a mask every time his own head had felt far too small for his mind. Ali's loud sounds can cause alarm. He wants understanding. He never wants to harm. When he said he can't help but scream and cry, employers have told Ali his words are a lie. They say that his brain is not full to its brim. They say they know Ali's brain better than him. But now this diagnosis is a badge of pride for wanting to wear the same clothes in and outside. A trophy for when he fell, however hard he tried. A bridge over every instruction whose intent was only implied. An embrace instead of fear for when he screamed and cried. Instead of a boat upon railway tracks, he's gained a train to ride to where he's not called Dumb for liking lists a mile wide. Although this does not heal when his condition was denied. You're not strange. Be the change. Spice up your life now. Too much pain. Stop the blame. Ali, you know how. Viva forever pride. You're who you know yourself to be. Your neuro spicy in a world can be a joy to see. I know what that one's about. <laughs> I definitely get that one. Um, so what, what prompts you to write that kind of poem? Um, that I think that attitudes and awareness towards autism are really changing. Um, it's not uncommon people who are autistic getting into poetry. And there's kind of like this uh, assumption that autistic people don't have connections to emotions. And, you know, it's just uh, different ways of being, just different ways of being. And uh, certainly there is some incredibly emotional, amazing poetry from uh, various neurodiverse artists and um, yeah Manchester is rich uh, the city in which I live for being full of uh, poets many of whom uh, are on that spectrum and uh, yeah I wanted to write something celebratory realistic full of some of the more challenging things that I know people to whom I'm close have experienced but ultimately one of celebration 
Perfect, lovely. Um, so, have you got time to squeeze one more in? Um, yeah, yeah, I won't do any more Ali and Zane. I'll tell you what, I'll do one of my old poems. And uh, having ended on a, a positive note, I'll just do something really gloomy about veganism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, woo! All right, it's one of my old ones. I've not said this for ages. Let's see if I remember it. I think it goes like this. Protein is a biochemical compound whose name Bazelius found. Von Voigt claimed flesh makes flesh. Then sang a sequence insulin. Peritz prized haemoglobin. The Swedish were impressed. More studies on its benefits directed mutagenesis as Weissman had foreseen. Now to give these claims such credence does not distract from this grievance. Where do vegans get protein? What exactly do you eat? It's not healthy, no meat. Such Shakespearean introspection between the facts to delve lament. B12 or not B12? Surely that must be the question. Well, it's simple to eat sensible. The soya bean lacks cholesterol. It's easily fortified and cooked can taste exceptional, tongue tinglingly sensual. And yes, it does provide protein as does peanut butter, black beans, flax seeds, pecans, almonds, lentils and cashews. And yet this is my beef. I hear debates on my belief. People question what I choose. When I don't choose for pigs to feel, I don't believe that pain is real. That's fact, not myth, not needed. So could we in evolution swap those myths for resolution? See the cruelty superseded for the facts of proteins, chemistry, our documents through history, they're laid out plain and clear. So I'll hopefully wait for an honest, heartfelt date when protein's myth will finally disappear. You're a vegan. <laughs> I mean, I don't mention it much. I don't mention it. I don't like to go on. They should be telling me a teetotal. <laughs> um, well, Another great poem. Thank you so much for that, Dominic. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for giving me this space. I really appreciate it. What a joy to share with uh, you. Thank you. I mean, it's just a green screen area. It's not actually a wall. Um, <laughs> but you're welcome. And thank you for, for being in our spotlight. <laughs> right. And thank you so much again for those, po those poems, Dominic. Oh, absolute joy. Uh, that's almost the end of the show for now. But on screen, you can see our contact details. It is at The Cud TV on your social media. And if you want to catch up with the previous episodes, you can always binge us on YouTube looking for Chewing the Cud. Thank you for watching and we'll see you soon. Bye. Yeah.